I'm going to give you a paper tonight that originally I gave uh, 10 years ago at FAS, and since that time additional information has come to light. Um, I gave a very, very truncated version of this paper a couple weeks ago at the uh, fifth Tampa Bay Area Scientific Information Symposium over in, uh, in Pinellas, or south here in Pinellas County. Um, so this is the full paper I would have liked to have given then, so you get the full thing. Now, I've only given this a few times, so you're going to have to pardon me. I'm going to have to do some reading tonight. There's a lot of names and dates and figures which aren't memorized yet, um, so I'm going to have to refer to my notes. Um, one of the, probably one of the most common questions archaeologists get, and some of you that are interested in archaeology, is who are the Indians here? Were they Calusa? Were they Tamukua? Typical. Uh, we get this question, and, and some of us try very, very hard to correct the inaccuracies we find written in newspapers, uh, books, and now on the internet. Um, for many years, for I'd say 15, 20 years, as I've read various books, I've collected tidbits of historical information about the natives that were in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, a little bit here and there, particularly in the works of uh, John Han and John Worth, uh, two of the major translators of original uh, Spanish documents, um, and other sources that have come to light. So a little bit here and there, and so what I've tried to do is um, draw all this together to give us a history, such as it now exists, a chronological history of what we know of the named peoples that were here around Tampa Bay. Now, please keep in mind that tonight I'll be talking about history, uh, projecting the names that we have into prehistory, I maintain is illegitimate. Uh, it's rather like concluding that because I live in a house that was built in 1913, burghers lived there a thousand years ago. Uh, prehistory is not history. Uh, now, you know, in archaeology, we define archaeological cultures based on material assemblages and associations. Um, but at the same time, ethnography has provided us with many examples of distinctively different societies that share the same material culture. And from this, we have to keep in mind that archaeological and ethnographic cultures are not necessarily the same thing. Um, as one of our grand predecessors in archaeology, W.H. Holmes wrote, traces of particular peoples fade out quickly into the generalized past. See, with, without a time machine, there's a lot of questions we will never be able to answer because it is prehistory. Uh, I'll present, along with some of the facts, some of my own speculations here tonight. Now, scientific investigations often begin with speculations, but as I learned in the fifth grade, unless the speculation can generate testable implications that does not rise to the level of an hypothesis. Uh, that's what's called the scientific method, and that's what I try to follow in my work. Now, speculating is fun, uh, but if it only results in just another just-so story, it really doesn't advance uh, our knowledge about the past. So I'll admit right up front that uh, um, it must be true. I read it on the internet. It doesn't get very far with me. <laughs> Now, on April 1498, Amerigo Vespucci reportedly sailed the entire length of the Florida Gulf Coast, uh, and the 1502 Cantino map, which was presumably drawn from his notes, shows Florida with coastal indentations corresponding with Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, and Estero Bay. This period begins, uh, marks the beginning of European uh, incursions into La Florida, and also the beginning and the end of its native inhabitants. <clears throat> Though certainly preceded by various others, Ponce de Leon, you know, officially discovered and named Florida during his voyages of 1512 to 1513. He was the first to report the ferocity of the inhabitants uh, suffering a fatal wound in 1521 that probably uh, happened down in the Charlotte Harbor area. There were other early visits to the Florida West Coast. Uh, in 1516, Diego Morello traded with the coastal natives of, of the West Coast. In 1517, 
the Cordoba slaving expedition was attacked while making ship repairs, again probably at Charlotte Harbor. Uh, in 1519, four ships under Pineda were sent by the governor of Jamaica to explore the Gulf Coast from the Keys to Panico, Mexico. Um, and uh, with the depopulation of the native depopulation of the Caribbean islands, Spanish slavers began increasingly to hunt along both coasts of Florida uh, to look for more slaves. And what we need to keep in mind, of course, is that every landing party or shipwreck survivor became another potential disease vector. Now, while the direct atrocities of the Spanish are legendary to many of us, uh, the introduction of European diseases was a greater cause of native mortality and cultural disruption. When a pathogen enters what we call a virgin population, the chief victims are the very young and the elderly. Now, among the preliterate native societies of Florida, tr cultural traditions were transmitted by word of mouth from one generation to the next. So with these diseases uh, coming in to the populations, with the deaths of both the storytellers and their young audiences, uh, sociocultural systems fragmented. Uh, so weakened from within and without, a, a downward spiral began amongst the native populations. And this was further exacerbated by entrenched behaviors of intergroup raiding. Uh, it, it seems kind of strange when we look at it today that even in the face of depopulation, enslavement, and increasing European colonization, native tribes continued to kill each other. In April 1528, the new governor of La Florida, uh, Panfilo de Narvaez, landed a force at a native village somewhere along the western Pinellas Peninsula. Uh, from this point, Narvaez marched northeast to Old Tampa Bay, then north, likely to the village at Safety Harbor, Philippi Point, later known as the seat of the Tocobaga. However, subsequent retellings by others notwithstanding, uh, Cabeza de Baca, who chronicled the Narvaez expedition, gave no names for the Indians, villages, or chiefs of the area. There is no mention of any Iriigua, Usita, or Tocobaga in that first account. The early European accounts contained varied but generally limited information about the different aboriginal tribes and their dialectical subdivisions. Ethnocentric projection by the explorers may sometimes have misidentified chiefdoms in the strict anthropological sense of the term among some groups where none actually existed. The Europeans projected their own hierarchical structures and terminology on the societies they encountered. Now, we, we face a, a basic unresolvable uncertainty relating to many of the native names found in the Spanish accounts. Recorded names with various phonetic transcriptions and spellings may have reflected the appellations of actual chiefs, temporary headmen, specific villages, geographic areas, specific dialectical subgroups, or larger language stocks, or conflations of various of the actual native meanings of the terms. And some native terms may actually have been one, language's, one language group's own name for another language group rather than that group's name for itself. So you see, there's many caveats we have to keep in mind when we use such names as, has, as have survived in, in the different accounts. Now, the Debaca account describes the Narvaez landing site village as consisting of small huts and a very large one capable of holding more than 300 persons. Uh, subsequent accounts mention the presence of large structures, sometimes singular, sometimes multiple, at some South Florida sites, uh, villages. Now, when singular, among other smaller structures, these large structures may have been chief's houses or council houses. When multiple, they may indicate communal living facilities for 30 to 50 people each, or perhaps clan houses. Um, Another problem is that such features have yet to be discovered and archaeologically excavated. We, we don't have any, any sample here. Devaka's description of what was likely the Safety Harbor Village relates nothing as to its size, the interest there having been the discovery of a little bit of corn and of European shipwreck items that had been salvaged by the local natives. Uh, a village some 10 or 12 leagues northerly was described as having 15 houses and a large ripe maize field. 
Now an additional difficulty in using the Spanish accounts arises from the different writers' unspecified use of either the legua legal of 2.63 miles or the legua commune of 3.46 miles in citing the distances. A single uniform measurement by the Spanish for the league was not established until 1801. So this is another difficulty we have in using these accounts and trying to locate where some of these identified uh, villages uh, were. Now the native reaction to Narvaez's landing had been to immediately abandon their village and flee at night in their canoes. There was no violent response to his arrival as had occurred with the Ponce de Leon and Cordoba down in the Calusa region in Charlotte Harbor. Now a 300 uh, person capacity structure at the landing village certainly indicates that a cacique or chief of some standing lived at this site. Further, the Spaniards' burning of crated corpses found at what was likely the safety harbor site, perhaps atop its large temple mound, failed to elicit any native response worthy of mention by Debaca. Now, so we might ask, why the flea response at western Tampa Bay and not down at Charlotte Harbor? Well, perhaps this was due to the greater socio-political integration, the greater concentration of power held by the Calusa Cacique down to the south, who was a true paramount chief controlling a large body of warriors. Now, Garcilaso de la Vega, known as the Inca, is the sole authority for the accounts of Narvaez's cruelties to Iri Igua, named as the cacique of the initial landing site village and later the torturer of Juan Ortiz. The Florida of the Inca, his book, largely relates the story of the 1539 Hernando de Soto expedition, but it was written in Spain 60 years later. And he used the manuscripts of Carmona and Coles, as well as information from an anonymous uh, informant, who all three being de Soto expedition survivors, in writing what is admittedly a rather fanciful book, and a very thick book if, if you've read it. The account of the gentleman of Alvas, who was possibly Alvaro Fernandez, a member of the De Soto expedition, first published in 1557, would have been available to Garcilaso, but it identifies Usita, not Iraigua, as the local cacique in 1539. Now, according to Garcilaso, after Narvaez had cut off Iraigua's nose, fed his mother to the war dogs, and then headed north to his own fate, an expedition searching for Narvaez arrived from Cuba, was tricked into sending some men ashore, and Juan Ortiz was captured. And from, from his account, each time Iri Igua attempted to blow his nose and failed to find it, the devil seized him with the thought of avenging himself on Juan Ortiz, as if that young man personally had deprived him of his nostrils. The very sight of the Spaniard always brought past offenses before his eyes, and such memories increased each day his anger and lust for retribution. Now, after three years' captivity, um, the chief's daughter helped Ortiz escape to Mocoso, a cacique who lived two days' journey from the bay, where Ortiz spent the nine years until De Soto's arrival. Now this is according to the gentleman of Elvas's account who was a member of the expedition. In a 1908 article, Francis Fleming, who was the former governor of Florida and the previous president of the Florida Historical Society, totally invented the name Ulele for Ira Igua's daughter, who was, of course, beautiful, very beautiful. Totally invented that. By 1920, her name had become Ulela, a princess of lustrous beauty, courtesy of uh, Moore Wilson in, in one of her publications. So you see, there is no name for the supposed daughter of the local chief. Total invention. In 1539, the uh, De Soto Entrada arrived somewhere along the southeastern shore of Tampa Bay and occupied the village of Isita. Now, whether located in coastal Manatee County or further north in, in coastal Hillsboro, uh, the village had been abandoned just before De Soto had arrived. The accounts of expedition members Elvas and Biedma supply some details about the socio-political organization of the Tampa Bay area at this time. 
In about 1531, Makoso, the cacique living some eight leagues from the bay, had raided and burned the town of Uzita. Cacique Uzita, captor of Ortiz, had fled to another of his coastal towns, apparently to the one subsequently occupied by De Soto. Now, 20 to 30 leagues distant from Usita lived Iripercosi, to whom Makoso, Uzita, and all they that dwelt along the coast paid tribute. Now, this name Iripercosi, which is actually an honorific signifying a war chief in the Tumuquan language, indicates the Tampa Bay region was at that time under the hegemony of the Tumuqua to the north. Now, Makoso's previous raid on Usita indicates Urpericosi had less than full control over his ostensible underlings. The accounts indicate both Usita and Makoso were independent, localized, simple chiefdoms consisting of a number of villages. In the diary of Rodrigo Ranjel, who was De Soto's secretary, as edited by Oviedo, uh, Makoso complained to De Soto about the chief's Neguarete, Capalue, Usita, and Oriigua, the last apparently being the Iriigua of Garcilaso. And in looking at these accounts, we, we note that Elvas and Biedma, members of the expedition, had identified Usita as Ortiz's captor, Garcilaso the Inca had identified Iriigua as Ortiz's captor, and Ron Hell, the sort of secretary, had identified two separate chiefs, Usita and Oriigua. Makoso had been threatened by the other regional caciques because he had befriended De Soto and given him Ortiz. Thus, from this we see there were numbers of lesser chiefs in the area, all, at times fighting each other, who were subservient to a more powerful chief to the extent they tribute. And these linkages crossed linguistic boundaries. Uh, the, the gentleman of Elvas wrote that Uzita and Makoso spoke mutually unintelligible languages. And we know, as I mentioned, Uriparicosi is certainly Tumukuan, as is the honorific prefix of, prefix of Iri Igua. So rather than being a tightly controlled, centralized, paramount chiefdom under a Tumukuan overlord, the Tampa Bay region at this time apparently consisted of squabbling independent fiefdoms wherein one gained a certain temporary ascendancy over the others sufficient to extract tribute. Makoso's circa 1531 raid on Usita may have been precipitated by Ortiz's escape. According to Garcilaso the Inca, before uh, the capture of Ortiz, Makoso had sought marriage with the beautiful Ulele, um, and after Ortiz's escape, Iriigua, or Sita, had demanded the uh, return of Ortiz, enlisting the assistance of the big man, Iriparicosi, described by Garcilaso as Makoso's brother-in-law. Uh, Makoso refused, uh, Iriigua then likely refused him, Ulele, and then Makoso came and raided and burned Uzita's village. Now, a relatively powerful headman who can't even keep his vassals from killing each other could hardly unite the forces uh, necessary to confront a well-armed European force, which De Soto had, so Iriparicosi used subterfuge. He never met with De Soto. He sent word to him that the goal the Spaniards thought, sought was further north, outside his territory in the lands of his enemies, the Apalachee. Smart move. Perhaps he had dealt with De Soto only through messengers because of the tenuous control he had over his ostensible underlings, one of whom, as I mentioned, Makoso, had already made an independent pact with the conquistador. Clearly, the tribes of Tampa Bay were composed a loosely integrated regional system, unstable due to all participants actively seeking personal advancement, with alliances short-lived. Terming it a loosely integrated complex chiefdom seems to overstretch the available evidence that we have. A chiefdom may be defined as a number of settlements existing under the central administration of a single hereditary leader whose status and political power is ascribed by genealogy rather than achieved by personal effort. We know in much of the southeast such chiefdoms were based upon exogamous matrilineages. But at Tampa Bay, there is no definitive evidence for ascribed versus achieved rank amongst its native leaders or for matrilinearity, which is a situation in which 
um, the chief's son, uh, pardon me, the chief's sister's son would succeed to power, his nephew rather than his own son. This is metrolinearity. Now it is, as I mentioned when I started out, um, it's fun to, to speculate and, and thinking about, about these points uh, and building on multiple suppositions. It might be speculated that Ulele was actually maybe Uzita's niece rather than his daughter. And if she had no brother under a matril matrilineal system, she might have been the heir apparent for tribal leadership. Female caciques were not unknown among southeastern tribes. Uh, witness the uh, meeting of DeSoto with the Lady of Cafita Chiqui somewhere in the Carolinas. Now, according to Elvas, in, in treating Usita for Ortiz's life, Ulele had said it would be an honor to have a Spaniard for a captive. Now, you, you know, think about it. Such a rare commodity would certainly have been an object of power as well as a potent sacrifice to the gods should circumstances warrant. If indeed uh, a marriage to Mocoso had been planned, as Garcilaso claimed, Ulede helping Ortiz escape to Mocoso may have been part of a larger scheme to wrest power from Usita. But this is all admittedly just speculation on my part and something we need a time machine to address. But again, it's fun to think about such things. To what might Uruparacosi's power to extract tribute be attributed? The limitations of soils mostly ill-suited aboriginal style agriculture restrain the full expression of the Mississippian sociocultural system in most of Florida. Only in the panhandle among the Appalachian were the classic Mississippian subsistence practices truly effective in supporting complex stratified societies. Success was variable elsewhere in the peninsula. Accounts indicate only partial reliance on agricultural product, produce. Uh, again, the Devaca account ind indicates there was some maize at Safety Harbor, more 10 to 12 leagues north. De, De Soto found no great amount of produce until arriving at the town of Etocale, over 20 leagues from Tampa Bay. Um, now, Elvas related that Ortiz had claimed the land of Uruparacosi, 30 leagues inland, was fertile and abounding in maize. And perhaps this was the key to Uruparacosi's power. With such a reliable food source capable of supplying a storable surplus, Uruparacosi would have had the ability to support a larger body politic and a correspondingly larger number of warriors. Thus, was a war chief. Uh, at least as long as the local hammock soils held out. Now, while coastal populations can, can harvest sufficient protein from the estuaries, reliable sources of carbohydrates are another matter. Wild starch sources intensively gathered from interior hammock and wetland areas could easily be exhausted, and seasonally available nuts would be less reliable than a storehouse of maize. Over-harvesting of estuarine resources archaeologically apparent in Shelman's by the increased frequency of minimal sizes among all the harvested molluscan species, could further limit coastal populations no longer able to find new unoccupied stretches of shoreline to which to move. Expanding populations harvesting everything edible inexorably leads to shortages, stress, warfare, and the need for greater levels of management. Now, the minimal archaeological evidence for maize in peninsular Florida invites some more interesting speculation as to its possible use for ritual, non-subsistence behaviors. So too do some human bone studies that indicate maize ingestion at some Mississippian sites was apparently limited just to higher status individuals. Now, currently, a number of archaeologists are interpreting strata composed of relatively soil-free, largely whole airspace shellfish found in mounded midden deposits, what appear to be rapidly, uh, relatively rapid mass loading events uh, as evidence of feasting activities. Uh, some years ago, a cultural anthropologist, and I neglected to buy his book at the time, found that practically all known human cultures had devised some method to alter consciousness. His conclusion that humans have a need to get high was not appreciated by the federal DEA. I remember reading about that in the newspaper. So again, this is speculation, folks, but did the maize 
overlords distribute some of their harvest to their vassal chiefs for the production of beer. He who supplies the alcohol controls the feast. Discounting the fragments of brown glass we often find in our screens, uh, how might we look for evidence of consciousness expanding or deadening behaviors? As I say, speculation is fun. Back to our chronology. In 1549, the West Coast was visited by a ship of Dominican missionaries led by Padre Luis Cancer de Barbastro and accompanied by a converted Indian woman uh, they were guided by Indians captured along the coast during their trip from Cuba and arrived, they arrived somewhere on Tampa Bay. After a landing party entered the interior, Juan Munoz, locally held captive since the DeSoto expedition, appeared and reported that two other religious had been killed by the Indians and a sailor was being held captive. Against the urgings of his fellows, Father Cancer swam ashore where he was killed in sight of his shipmates who then cast off to return to Cuba. According to one account, Munoz was so disfigured that if he had not spoken Spanish, they would have taken him for an Indian. So you see the long captivity of Ortiz was, was not unique. Also in 1549, three ships en route from Mexico to Spain were wrecked uh, along the, the west coast of Florida. One of the survivors, Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda, was held captive by the Calusa for 17 years. In his memoir, written about 1575, he listed from north to south along the west coast the Apalachee, Mogoso, Tocobaga, Asquivete, and Calusa tribes. This is perhaps the earliest mention we have so far of the Tocobaga. In 1567, Governor Menendez de Aviles sailed up Old Tampa Bay to the Safety Harbor site bringing Kalos, paramount chief of the Calusa, to make peace with Tocobaga. By this time, the control of the West Coast was effectively divided between these two long warring Indian leaders. Now this was a meeting between two paramount chiefs. Kalos of the Calusa reportedly had 50 subject towns speaking at least 24 different languages. Tocobaga summoned his vassals, whose travels from distant locations required four days' time. Some 29 caciques, 100 headmen, and others joined Tocobaga, more than 1,500 people, according to Solis de Maris, for this parley between him, Governor Menendez, and Carlos. So we see that the level of sociopolitical organization of Tampa Bay had radically changed since the time of Uruparacosi and De Soto. Now, regrettably, the accounts do not give names or locations for Tocobaga's vassals. However, a general boundary is indicated. When addressing Menendez's desire to find a purported connection between Tampa Bay and the St. John's River, Cacique Tocobaga told him such an effort would not be possible without more men due to the, due to the numerous and hostile Indians on the way. That is to say, the region to the east-northeast of Tampa Bay was outside his control. We know that by 1564, Kalos of the Calusa had extended his influence as far north as the present, present Orlando area, having sent a trusted Spanish shipwreck survivor, perhaps Fontaneda, to live there with his ally, Ochaqua. Further, Fontaneda wrote that the people of Canigacola, living on or near the River of Canes, probably the Suwannee, were subjects of Tocobaga. So, in less than 40 years, the Tocobaga, a group not mentioned in any earlier accounts, independent of the Tamukua, had taken control of much of the central west coast. Fontaneda's listed Calusa town of Yagua may be the earlier Uriyagua, perhaps having lost its Uri, its war chief, to Calusa encroachment. Now, as rivers often served as natural territorial boundaries, it may be that the Manatee River was then the boundary between Calusa and Tocobaga. Now, Fontanada wrote of Mocoso, south of and subject to the Apalachee of the Panhandle, who were the, the principal tribe in the Panhandle. In 1564, La Donnier of the French expedition up to St. John's had written of a Mocoso or Mocozo as one of nine chiefs allied to the Otina Tumukua somewhere in the upper St. John's watershed. 
Now, while Jerry Milanich felt a correspondence with the previous Mokoso of the Tampa Bay region was unlikely, such an inland chief tribe could have moved even further into the interior when faced with growing Tokabaga and Calusa dominance and perhaps growing resource scarcities. Historical accounts certainly document considerable moves by different native groups. Now the fluidity of native alliances is apparent in a 1567 account. After the execution of Kalos I by the Spanish down at Estero Bay, the chiefs of at least two settlements previously subject to the Calusa transferred their allegiance to Tocobaga. So the boundary zone between these two polities fluctuated. Complex chiefdoms experienced periods of emergence, expansion, and fragmentation, with regional simple chiefdoms cycling between greater or lesser degrees of centralization. Now this fluidity may reflect the foraging lifestyles of most of the aboriginal groups of the peninsula. Uh, vagaries in local carrying capacities could not be addressed by intensification of effort in the absence of agriculture. Only so much could be gathered from within a circumscribed territory. Resource scarcities in the face of population increases, seasonal availabilities, over harvesting, or random natural calamities could be addressed through seizure of the resources of others, however. Those with sufficient resources could maintain their independence through strength of arms, sometimes necessitating at least temporary alliances, but ultimately each band or tribe was looking out for itself. Now looking at the greater southeast as a whole, intersocietal warfare became endemic among those dependent upon agricultural subsistence as well, in part because of the relative scarcity of suitable farmlands. When subsistence is based upon foraging and natural resources are over harvested, the same situation occurs. Moving en masse into the resource poor interior pine flatwoods is not a viable option for Florida's West Coast natives. There's just not that much out there. In 1568, Menendez Marquez sailed to Safety Harbor and found that the 30-man garrison left there by his uncle had been slaughtered. Uh, Marquez's troops burned the entire deserted village, including its temple structure, and then withdrew. Father Rohel learned from native informants that Tokabaga's captain, the second in command, had ordered these killings. The cacique Tokabaga, the paramount, had been absent in his own village at the mouth of the bar. This was possibly the Maximo Point site. There was no native response to the torching of the village and no record of any subsequent Spanish retaliatory expedition against the Tocobaga. Now during the years between 1568 to 1608, Menendez's colonization attempts in South Florida at Ice, St. Lucie, Tequesta, Miami, Calos, Estero Bay, and Tocobaga, Old Tampa Bay, had failed. Spanish efforts largely centered on St. Augustine with religious missions established to the north and then spreading west into Appalachia. Wally attacks from the north and the repercussions of Drake's raid on St. Augustine resulted in military withdrawal in 1587 from Santa Elena and coastal San, uh, South Carolina. English incursions into Virginia kept Spanish attention directed northwards. A probable epidemic occurred in Florida in 1595. Reports of incursions and attempts to find shipwreck survivors led to occasional coastal searches and Spanish vis visits to the Charlotte Harbor region during the early 1600s. Now that information about events in the South Peninsula reached the governor in St. Augustine indicates a active communication network existed throughout the peninsula. News spread from one end of Florida to the other quite rapidly. Now repeatedly in the accounts, friars complain that the shifting nature of aboriginal settlement and subsistence stymied their attempts to concentrate, convert, and control the Indian groups. Now, regular seasonal movements of bands, combined with attempts by some to avoid Spanish control, resulted in southern movements of cimarrones, or runaways. Yet concurrently there was a native desire for European trade goods. As in the past, native traders likely continued to act as middlemen and communication conduits. However, such intergroup contacts resulted in the transmission of European diseases as well as goods. In 1608, the Patano Tamukua of north central Florida were being threatened by raids from the Tocobaga and the Pooi from Tampa Bay. Well, who were the Pooi? 
Swanton thought they were the same as the Asita and were located on Hillsborough Bay. Milanich thought they were equivalent to the Kapalui mentioned in the Ron Helicom. Whatever their origin, the complex chiefdom of Togabaga, as described earlier for 1567, had certainly changed. Perhaps factionalism arose after an important cacique died. Perhaps a European disease created turmoil. Perhaps it was a result of the inherent instability of native alliances. Whatever the cause, the result was that power became, became shared with the Puoi. A Tampa Bay region, Tokabaga Pu'oi alliance stood independent of the Calusa. Now this alliance began sending raiding parties to the north in the early 1600s, perhaps attempting to extend control into an area that was unsettled by Spanish activities. Raiders apparently canoed a Gulf Coastal route then continued up the Suwannee and Santa Fe rivers. In 1611, they attacked the Spanish mission of Kofa on the lower Suwannee, killing 17 converted Indians there. Spanish retaliation for the raid was swift. From St. Augustine, Governor Oliveira sent a force to Tampa Bay under Captain Badajoz by the same route that killed the offenders. Among the beheaded prisoners were the caciques of both Tocobaga and Puoy at Tampa Bay. Now the death of the Tocobaga cacique apparently resulted in a power shift in the alliance. During the summer of 1612, Ensign Cartaya was sent with 20 soldiers and a pilot on a mission further south to Charlotte Harbor. This force, uh, force stopped at Tampa Bay to visit the new cacique of Puoy and then continued south. The account does not mention any new cacique of Tocobaga, however. A Spanish report from 1614 described further tensions affecting this region of the state. The Calusa Paramount had sent 300 war canoes to the province of Mocoso, where some 500 men, women, and children were killed in two villages. The Paramount chief had then sent a dozen captive survivors to St. Augustine to warn both the Spanish and their Indian allies of his opposition to them. Governor Guimas ordered retaliation, the, uh, retaliation against the Calusa, dispatching two armed launches to exact the greatest punishment possible. Uh, what exactly happened, we, we still await the discovery of more documentation, but apparently punishment was exacted. Now while John Worth places the Mocoso in their 1539 location near Tampa Bay for this 1614 event, in the 1560s Fontaneda had located the Mocoso to the north of the Tocobaga and south of the Appalachee. Laudonnier pla placed Mogoso or Mocoso somewhere in the upper St. John's watershed. Thus it appears that the massive Calusa raid had bypassed Tampa Bay without any interference from what remained of the intervening Tocobaga Pu'oi polity. During the 1620s, raiding occurred between the Pu'oi and the Amacano, who were apparently located along the Gulf Coast just to the north of Tampa Bay. These raids may have led to the subsequent Spanish abandonment of the Kofa mission on the Lower Suwannee. In late 1628 or early 1629, Governor Borja sent a force to Tampa Bay to bring the captain of the Pu'oi to St. Augustine to negotiate a peace with Amacano. By 1634, the Pu'oi were apparently allied with or subject to the Calusa. In 1636, further Pu'oi raids resulted in a dispatch of Spanish soldiers to the Temucuan province of Abinaudi along the upper St. John's to find guides and to construct 20 canoes for a retaliatory expedition. Now significant for the entire peninsula are reports of epidemics of plague, smallpox, and measles for 1612 through 1617, 1649, 50, 55, 59, and 72. So you see remnant survivors of increasingly fragmented native societies became wandering disease vectors. Continuing tribal raiding appears curious when the total, small total number of European invaders is considered. Age old patterns held sway with raids perhaps additionally motivated by the desire for European goods as well as the need to expand resource procurement territory. Exogamous marriage requirements could facilitate alliances or exacerbate captive taking. Perhaps a belief that the mysterious sicknesses spreading through their territories were caused by sorcery required increasing numbers of reprisal raids between the remnant tribes. 
1674 and 75, the Bishop of Cuba, Calderon, made a visitation to the provinces of Florida and reported his findings to the Queen. Uh, regrettably, our, the, the map that accompanied his letter has not been located. Describing points north, he wrote that four leagues beyond the principal village of the Calusa at Estero Bay was the Bay of Tampa, which would indicate that the original bay of that name was actually Charlotte Harbor. Six leagues from the beach of Pusale, location unknown, was the Puoy River, and 12 leagues farther, that of the Tocopagas. While Calderon mentioned the Puoys, the Pineros, and the Tocobagas along the west coast, north of the Calusa, he did not himself visit the area. Prior to 1675, we know that some Tocobagas had moved north to the Wasissa River in present Jefferson County, which is generally up in here. They, um, they lived in a settlement containing mixed remnants of other unidentified tribes. In 1678, the Spanish religious visitor Laturiando counted 348 people in this village. Their assigned work was to transport produce from eastern Appalachia and western Eustaga by canoe down the Wasissa and Oscilla rivers to the Gulf, south along the coast, then up the Suwannee and Santa Fe rivers to a landing from where it was transported overland to St. Augustine. And of course, this is a map of the times, very artistic. This would be the Suwannee here in their schema. Um, these uh, Tocobaga also assisted in removing cargo uh, to lighten Spanish ships that were other otherwise unable to cross the relatively shallow mouth of the Suwannee River for those ships to reach the port of San Martin, which was located about four leagues upriver. In 1679, uh, Governor Salazar sent um, Captain La Cruz and a small force that included Tamuqua allies, again down to Calusa land, to Charlotte Harbor, to ransom some reported Spanish shipwreck captives. Traveling by canoe down the Santa Fe and Suwannee rivers to the Gulf, the force followed the coast south to Alcola, a village of up to 300 persons, then traveled overland to Puoy, described as a comparably, comparably sized village. The Puoy cacique reported that Kalos had ordered him to prevent the expedition from going any further south. The warning was ignored by the group, and the force proceeded south to Alafe, possibly on the Alafaya, a village that contained up to 40 people, then moved on to Ap Apahola Negra, which contained about 20 people, then on to Tiquiagua, a village of about 300 people. At this point, the Tamuqua allies decided to heed the Calusa warning that had been repeated at each village and returned south, and very shortly the uh, Spanish faction did an about face and went back to St. Augustine as well. Now, this account mentions no Tocobagas at Tampa Bay, again, 1679. Alcola to the north might have been Tocobaga, Amacano, or others. The account does clearly indicate, however, the Bay Area, Bay Area was under nominal Calusa control at this time. The Tocobaga Puoy Alliance was effectively gone. Now, the village name of Tiquiagua, where they all finally decided to turn around and go back, is kind of interesting. This perhaps was the same Iriagua or Iriagua and Yagua of the earlier accounts. Um, now, discovery of 16th and century, uh, 17th century Spanish materials at a burial mound near present DeSoto Nash Memorial in Bradenton indicates a possibility for the people who we may call the Yagua, following from those terms we have. There is little archival information about the Tampa Bay region for the 1680s. Natives from Wale and fear the Chichimecos fled south from coastal interior Georgia into the peninsula. Yamas Yamases were raiding the Northeast Florida missions. In 1688, during his visitation to Appalachia, uh, Governor Lasada met the son of the Calusa Cacique and many of his leading men. We're talking, you know, up here. And they came from down here. The large party, this is the son of the, the Paramount and his principles, they could travel unmolested all the way from the Charlotte Harbor region to Appalachia. Appalachia clearly indicates their effective subjugation of any remaining Tocobaga, Pu'oi, Amacano, or others along the route. 
1695, the Spanish religious visitor Florencia noted that Tocobaga were still present in the area that was Sissa River settlement. In 1699, acting on a rumor that the British were preparing five ships in Charleston to establish a settlement on Tampa Bay, Governor Ayala sent Ensign Rodrigo, three soldiers, and a group of Tamuqua allies overland from the village of San Francisco de Patano, near present Gainesville, to investigate. In approaching Tampa Bay, they kept, camped at an abandoned village called Alafe, and it brings to mind Alafaya, then traveled to the southern border of the bay and to a river they named the San Salvador, called in the language of the natives Alamiva. This is quite possibly today's Manatee River. A diary kept by Diego Pena, one of the soldiers of the expedition, is often very confusing in its descriptions of directions and features they encountered, but arriving at Tampa Bay, Pena wrote that <clears throat> the village of Pu'oi remained behind us to the west, 12 leagues distance from that bay by land. From the coast on the south, leaving the edge of the bay, in order to go to Pu'oi, it takes three days by sea, according to what these Indian guides say. It follows from this, then, that the village of Pu'oi was then located to the north of Tampa Bay. Continuing his his account. Also inland, not very far from this bay, there are the following villages. Acasa, Alachipoyo, Amaca, Telefasole, and Ereze. There are more places in this vicinity which are the following. La Fiabatesca, Lele, Tiqui, Sole, Huya, and Piaja, which is a village that has many people. These latter are the ones that are close by the said bay. I've not seen these villages, but those that know of them have declared it thus to me. So you see, we had quite a number of villages right around Tampa Bay. The expedition was visited by the cacique of the village of Cayuco, another village, who knew of no British visits to the bay. During their nine days time, uh, the expedition being there, three of those days were occupied with sounding and scudding around the bay possibly at Point Pinellas, or perhaps near the mouth of the Manatee River, a large cross was erected with an attached warning sign. Visited by unidentified local inhabitants, Ensign Rodrigo instructed them to send word north if any Englishmen should appear. Some of them told him that the Indians that had lived at the mouth of this bay had been called Tampas, and others called them Fantabales, but they had gone north. This appears to be a reference to the formerly present Tocobaga. Now, the English trade in native slaves provided by their Indian allies was a major factor affecting the entire Southeast during the period of 1670 to 1715. In the early 1700s, slave raiding by Creeks and Yamases and British invasions led to Spanish abandonment of the West Tamuqua hinterland. The destruction of the North Florida missions gave raiders open access to the remnant native populations of the Southern Peninsula. In 1708, British South Carolina Indian agent Thomas Nairn reported that Creek slavers had to go as far south as the firm land would permit in order to find and capture the remaining natives. What uh, translator John Han refers to as the terror continued to increase after this period of time. The Wasissa River um, Tokabaga apparently moved further inland as a result of raids that occurred in 1704. After that year, some Pu'oi and Alifais from Tampa Bay had moved to a village nine leagues south of St. Augustine, as well as to a mission site um, within the uh, Gain greater Gain today Gainesville area. In 1726, that mission site was identified as a mixed settlement of Tamukua, Pu'oi, and Alifais. In 1718, Ribera was sent to St. Mark's to build a blockhouse at the port of San Marcos de Apalachi. Plans for the fort indicate there were two small Tocobaga settlements in the vicinity, one on the shore a short distance west of the mouth of the St. Mark's. Actually, I think I'm a little off. I think we're off the map here a little bit. And the other a short distance upstream on the first waterway to the east. Ribera found no more than about two dozen Tocobaga in the area and settled them upstream along the Wakala River. Later in 1718, a small Tocobaga community on the, still on the Wasissa was attacked by Pu'oi coming in from the Gulf. Former allies, now enemies. 
Now it's interesting, and we'll go back into a little bit of speculation here. In 1902, Clarence Moore excavated a burial mound on Marsh Island on Old Creek, probably today's Spring Creek, just to the west of the St. Mark's uh, River. Four of six burials intrusive into what was otherwise a prehistoric uh, Wheaton Island era mound included rusted articles of iron, glass beads, copper brass bells, and sheet brass tubular beads. Um, the Solana map, I'm sorry you can't read it here, plus it's sideways, um, indicates an Indian village on what's called the Chichave River in about this location. A few Tocobaga were still living in the San Marcos de Apalache area in 1723. By 1755, they'd been completely destroyed by the raiding creeks, such that we might, of course, <laughs> we don't have the remains to study. We perhaps have the artifacts from C.B. Moore, but those six intrusive burials at the old creek site may have been some of the last of, if you will, our Tocobaga. In 1727, an epidemic killed all but a few of the refugee Pu'oi, Alifais, and Amakapira at a mixed village located just to the south of St. Augustine. Remnants under Cacique Antonio Pu'oi, who identified himself as the head of the Alifiacosis nation, were present there in 1734 when the governor tried to move them closer to St. Augustine. Instead, they fled further south. In 1737, the virtual extermination of a mixed Pu'oi Amakapira village by the Bompto, a tribe living on the coast uh, south of Canaveral, included the deaths of its two caciques, one likely being Antonio Pu'oi. The village was apparently located somewhere inland west of present New Smyrna Beach. The attack precipitated a retaliatory massacre by the Calusa, past overlords of the Pu'oi against the Mayakas, allies of the Bomto. Old enemies, new enemies, old allies, new allies. Now when Maria Celle surveyed Tampa Bay in 1757, he encountered a few unidentified Indians armed with muskets. These could have been remnant Puoi and Alify, but their weapons probably indicate a Yamasee or Creek hunting party. In 1761, the Costas, or what was left of coastal tribal Indians, mixed, mixed remnants by then were in the Keys and under attack by raiding Uchises, and these people migrated to Cuba. The 1679 Jeffreys map shows islands near the mouth of the Willacoochee River labeled as the Pugoy Keys, right here, Farallon de Pugoy. And subsequent maps of the 1770s show similarly labeled islands near the mouth of the Suwannee. Now these are likely historical cartographic artifacts transferred from earlier maps such as the 1711 Chris map. Avia's uh, 1783 voyage to Tampa Bay found only Uchises, Talapusa, Choctaw, and Cuban fishermen at Tampa Bay. Uh, Foch's 1793 visit to the bay similarly found only Creek tribes in the Tampa Bay region. The original natives were gone. Now while written accounts relating to the native history, written history of Tampa Bay are limited in number, sketchy, garbled in the use of the names, and varied in the linear measurements, what league were they using this time? The summary I presented here presents at least the general story as of today. Now, we have our, some scholars, we now have our fingers crossed. With, uh, with Washington beginning to ease travel restrictions to Cuba, many of us have high hopes that the University of Florida's long-planned research project at the Havana Archives will occur and a wealth of documentation relate, relating to La Florida will become available. The archives have materials from the 1500s through the 1900s. In years to come, much more may be learned about the last natives of Tampa Bay, the people in between. Thank you.